Good morning. Good morning. It is. We want to welcome you to worship here at 1030 worship time at Knox. And if you would, I would encourage you to stand with us. And if you're watching online, stand with us here. I know it's a little unusual. You've all done it before, but let's stand everywhere we are and let's give our praise to Jesus, okay?
King, and I was thinking about what that means. Uh, kingship is something odd for me to think about. You know, I'm not, I'm not royal, <laughs> but uh, we have a sacrificial king who gave his life, who came down. And when you think about the words of the song, I'm forgiven, I'm accepted, I'm alive, his spirit's within us. Let's think about those words as we sing them up to him. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned, I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me, because you died and rose again. Amazing God, how can it be, you might keep you to be seated. And welcome to worship here at Knox Presbyterian Church. My name is Becca. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's a joy to be with you today, those of you who are here in person and those of you who are joining online. I don't know if you know this, but on this particular Sunday of the year, you get extra God points for showing up to church on time. (laughs) So um, there are remarkably more people here at this hour than there were at the early hour. Um, We're not going to name any names or actually dock any points, but I did tell them that you get points for being here and points for staying awake. So we'll be watching. No. 
Uh, those of you who are here in the room, as I highlight a few announcements, if you want to grab the pew pads here, let us know that you're worshiping with us today. If you're new or visiting, uh, we'd love if you were willing to share any contact information so that we can get in touch with you and share more about who we are and get to know more of who you are. Those of you, if there's any women who showed up Friday night ready to party, we're sorry, the women's mocktail party had to be postponed, but it is happening. So uh, keep your party gear ready and come back on Friday, March 24th for a time of fellowship and fun for all the women of the church. Uh, at this moment, probably, our high school youth are on their way back from their spring retreat, hopefully had a lot of fun, probably had very little sleep, uh, and most assuredly grew in their faith and in their relationships with one another. Today, after this service, we have our uh, first installment of our two-part Knowing Knox class. This is for anybody who wants to know more about the church and is interested possibly in becoming a member of this congregation. And so even if you didn't sign up, we got about 22 people signed up at this point. So kind of the more the merrier at this point. If you want to stick around for that, that's going to be upstairs in room 204. We've got a class time today, one on uh, Nope, Josh told me it's 2.04. We said wrong at 9 o'clock, so we like to trick people. Uh, that's how we wel welcome new members. Just give them the wrong new room numbers for things. It's fine. It's hazing. Uh, no, 2.04. Even if you didn't sign up, come join us. We'll have uh, time together today, uh, Wednesday night as well, uh, to join together and, again, learn how you can find your place here in this particular family of faith. And then Holy Week is coming, just a, a few weeks away, uh, where we get to prepare for and then celebrate uh, the great reason that we exist, which is the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, that week, we're going we're gonna to be sending out some information about this, but if you want to mark your calendar now, we've got Palm Sunday, regular worship. We've got Maundy Thursday, which we're going to have uh, a meal and then a family-friendly fri family experience of communion in Lehman Hall on Maundy Thursday. Good Friday, we'll have our Tenebrae service here on Friday night, and then Easter, we will celebrate with our sunrise service over in Veterans Park at 6.30 a.m., traditional worship at 9, and contemporary at 11. Easter's a time when people are looking, they're wanting to have a, a reason to, to go to church to celebrate the reason for Easter. And so uh, if you have any friends or neighbors uh, that are not part of a community of faith, it's a great time to invite them to come and join you for that wonderful day. Uh, I want to invite now Kirk Seitz to come forward to share a brief minute for mission. Good morning. My name is Kirk Seitz, and I'm here to talk to you on behalf of the Dakota Partnership. Knox has partnered with the Dakota Partnership for the past 30 years, providing support both financial and spiritual. The Dakota Partnership is designed to enhance and enable the development of Christian values in Dakota and other Native American communities by cultivating positive and enduring relationships and mutual understanding and building self-esteem. We do this through action that restore hope, encourage healthy values, promote responsible behaviors, and enhance worship experience. The Dakota Partnership focuses on four main activities, two of which are probably most familiar, the annual school backpack for Native American schools and Native Americans in Sisseton. This is the one where you collect school supplies and you bring them back here and they get trucked over to Sisseton. And there's also the annual Christmas gift giving uh, for the Native American children. Uh, some of you may know this as the angel tree, where you get to actually take the lists of which the kids fill out and what they want for Christmas. And we also truck those over to Sisseton so they can have a, a very Merry Christmas. Uh, the last two I'd like to talk to you about are the Vacation Bible School mission trips. Uh, the first one's going to be in Fort Peck, Montana from July 10th to July 14th. Uh, and then the one I'm going to focus on here is the Sisseton family mission trip, and I focus on family there. This is the week of June 24th through 30th. Uh, this is going to be the second trip since COVID, and we're hoping to have between 40 to 50 kindergarten through fifth grade students. So we're still in our rebuilding phase. Prior to COVID, it was about 200 kids, so we're still working that back up. Uh, this is one from last year where they shared their, their song at the end of uh, the week. Um, it's one of the pictures from that. But again, this is a family-oriented mission trip, uh, offering a variety of opportunities. So you can help in the kitchen or a classroom or be a part of the construction crew. And if you have young kids, they can actually be a part of the VBS itself. 
So when we first attended, uh, my daughter Marin turned nine when she was on the mission trip, uh, and she actually took part of the Vacation Bible School. Uh, my daughter Elena, who was 10 at the time, assisted with my wife Angel in the classroom. Uh, we went back again, uh, Elena and I, last year in 2022, and she helped with the VBS as a teen leader. Uh, I was a part of the construction crew. You can see some of the churches are a little worse for wear. Um, but we've worked on multiple church roofs, replacing ceiling tiles, lighting, and doing painting of churches, uh, just do overall general upkeep uh, so that they can come and enjoy their worship services. So I ask that as you're making your summer travel plans that you consider doing something a little bit different. Uh, try a different kind of vacation this year, one that can bring you together uh, closer as a family, but also have a positive impact on the lives uh, across the Dakota and Native American communities. So if you'd like more information, you can either come see me after the service or you can go to knoxprez.org. Uh, but thank you very much for your time. Before we take a minute to greet each other, I want to share the very good news from Anna and Brandon Board. Sophia Renee was born on Friday night at 10.30 p.m. Happy, healthy, yep. Very healthy little girl, almost seven pounds, and they are loving every minute. They got to have her mom and dad and sister here from Indiana with them. I got to go see them in the hospital yesterday, and they are just doing great. I appreciate your prayers and your support, and they're appreciating this time off to get to go home today and learn what it means to be a family of three. Uh, so I'm sure they'll be keeping us uh, you know, updated on how things are going. We can keep them in our prayers. Let's appreciate that we are a family here together by standing and greeting the people around you. And as you make your way back to your seats this morning, I would like to invite our children up for our children's message. Good morning, everybody. So I have a question for you. If I am starving, have you ever been starving before? If I am starving, how can these bananas help me? Eat them. Eat them. I could eat them. I could. What did, what did you say? I can't eat them. Why? They're plastic. There's no nutritional value here. It wasn't made to eat, so you probably shouldn't eat it. It's only for playing with, right? For pretending. So here's my next question. What if... I'll get you in a second. What if all your friends packed fake bananas in their lunch every day? Would you beg your parents not to pack a real banana and instead to pack a fake one for you? No. So you could be like all your friends? No. no. It would be silly, right? Because when we're hungry, we need to eat real food. So this is a silly, silly example of how someone might choose to be like everyone else rather than choosing wisely. Or, here's another one, have you ever had a time that you were really bugging your parents to get something because everyone supposedly had it? I, I'm seeing some of you like glance out to your parents like, maybe, maybe, was I? <laughs> We've all done it before. And finally, your parents say, okay, sure. And then you get whatever that thing was, and you realize, never done and you've, <laughs> they've never done that, and you've realized it wasn't all that great to have that thing, maybe because they are a little bit wiser than you may think. 
It's what the Israelites are doing to God. They are begging to have a king because everyone else has a king and they want to have a king. And so finally God says, okay, sure, I'll give you a king. But know that it's not what you are going to expect it to be. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a bad king. So remember, the Israelites are God's chosen people. They were chosen by God. And God is keeping his promises and laws. He's rescued them from Egypt. He's led them to the promised land. He's given them the land that they are to live in. And they have a judge. His name is Samuel. And Samuel's the, the judge that God has placed, the leader of his people. And now these people are saying, we want a king. And Samuel doesn't agree with them. He disagrees with them because them asking for a king is actually disobeying God. God told Samuel to warn them of what the life was going to be like, but the people still didn't listen. My friends, our God is sovereign, which means he's in control of all things. He allowed them to request to have this human king, but as we know, our God sent a perfect king who would be born many years later. So remember my silly banana idea? Why would anyone request to have a fake banana that's not going to satisfy your hunger instead of a real banana? Why would God's people want a human king when they had the king of heaven? My friends, our God is the only one who can satisfy our needs. When we want anyone or anything other than him, we're rejecting him. So there may be times in your lives when you want to have something really, really bad because everyone else wants it. But I encourage you to take a moment, stop, think about it, and see if that's what God wants you to have. And you may change your mind. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for this wonderful group of children and the freedom of choice that you give all of us. I ask that you please be with each and every one of them here in, and in their homes as we continue to walk with you and listen to your word. Thank you for your patience and forgiveness as we sometimes make the wrong choices. We love you, Lord, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. All right, you may head to Sunday school. Your teachers are waiting, and I would like to invite Rebecca up to read our scripture for us this morning. Today's scripture reading comes from Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, appoint us to sit on one, one on your right hand and one on your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. You are able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And the baptism which, with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left hand is not mine to appoint but it is for those whom, whom it has been prepared. When, when the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, you know, you know that um, among, <clears throat> among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers, the Lord is over them, and their great ones are, tri are triumphed over them, but it is not so among you. Instead, whoever 
wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be saved for all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Rebecca. That was way better than it had any right to be, considering how tired we all are and what day it is. Good morning, everybody. My name is David Bruner. I'm one of the pastors here. Fallen humanity uses power to serve itself. Redeemed humanity uses power to serve others. That's the theme I want to share with you today from our scripture. Before I read that scripture, let's pray together. Holy, mighty, merciful God, I pray, Lord, that you would send your Holy Spirit among us as we gather together for worship to hear the words of scripture. Inspire us, open our hearts and minds that we might not only hear your word, but understand it. Take it to heart and live it out in our lives. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who is the Word. Amen. So the reading for today is from 1 Samuel 8. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not follow in his ways but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to govern us. And the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Just as they have done to me from the day I brought them up out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so also they are doing to you. Now then, listen to their voice only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war in the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. He will take one-tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and his courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no, we are determined to have a king over us so that we also may be like other nations and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. 
The Lord said to Samuel, listen to their voice and set a king over them. Then Samuel said to the people of Israel, each of you return home. The word of the Lord. Fallen humanity uses power to serve itself. Redeemed humanity uses power to serve others. That's what I want to talk about. Let me set the stage a little bit. As many of you know, we're in the middle of a sermon series called Long Story Short. That's taking us through key parts of the biblical story from Genesis to Revelation. Last week, we looked at the Old Testament book of Joshua and Israel's entry into the Promised Land. Joshua is followed in the Old Testament by the book of Judges, which tells the story of Israel's earliest days in the land. While they were there, they were led by a series of leaders who were called judges. Each judge was appointed by God as a temporary leader, kind of a crisis manager to help resolve a particular problem or issue. And when it was over, the judge stepped down, went back to being an ordinary person. The last judge of Israel is named Samuel. There are two books in the Old Testament named after him, and we meet him in our reading for today. Samuel was a good judge, faithful, wise, widely respected. But there's a problem. His sons don't follow in his footsteps. And so as he, Samuel, gets older and they start looking for someone who might replace him, if there's a problem, his sons don't fit the bill. And in this moment of uncertainty, the elders of Israel approach Samuel and make a surprising request. They say, appoint for us a king to govern us like other nations. And the Bible says this request immediately displeased Samuel, and more importantly, God. So on one hand, they say, appoint us a king like other nations. A big part of the point of the whole Old Testament, and especially the law, is that Israel was not supposed to be like other nations. They were supposed to be holy, unique, in a way that reflected the holiness and uniqueness of the God they worship. Furthermore, the ideal in Israel up to this point was that God would rule directly over his people. There would be no permanent intermediary like a king. Asking for a king to rule Israel is implicitly rejecting this way of life. And God says as much in our scripture. They have not rejected you, Samuel. They have rejected me from being king over them. So this isn't just a political request. It reflects a change in spiritual priorities. Perhaps to Samuel's surprise, however, God agrees to their request. He basically says, go ahead, let them have what they want, but make sure you warn them. Make sure they know what they're getting into. Samuel does so. The people unfortunately don't listen. And in the end, Samuel the judge anoints the first king of Israel, a man named Saul. God allows his people to pursue a course of action he knows won't end well. I think this is something many of us can actually relate to in our own lives. We all have moments from time to time when we can see down the road a couple of steps and and we just know this course of action isn't going to work out very well, but we go along with it anyway for whatever reason. Uh, A couple months ago, my wife and I got a new couch to go into our living room at our house, and that meant our old couch could go down into the basement You know, you always have an upstairs couch and a downstairs couch, and the downstairs couch is never as good as the upstairs couch, right? So we're very excited about moving this couch into the basement, but the problem is it's, it's ginormous. It's a sectional couch. You have to take it into two chunks, and then you have to carry them down one at a time. And I'm, I'm, we get it into the, the top of the stairs going into the basement, and I look at the stairs, and I look at the couch, and I look at the stairs, and I look at the couch, and I think to myself, this is not going to fit. It's not going to fit. So I turn to my lovely wife, Becca, and I say, Becca, are we sure we want to do this? And she says, well, Dave, I think it'll fit. And I say, really? Because I don't think so. And she says, no, I definitely think it'll fit. And so we, we, 
talk for a little bit. Long story short, we decided to see if it was going to fit. And it did not. Um, I don't know how to explain this. Part of the couch got lodged in the stairwell going into the basement. It was like levitating a couple feet off the ground. Uh, and then that's when I knew we were in trouble. So I had to literally climb under the couch and shift from trying to pull it down to trying to push it out. It was a nightmare. Now, I'm telling you this story for two reasons. The first is that this is a story where I was right and my wife was wrong. <laughs> and I need to share those stories with you because they've happened very rarely. It's like a semi-annual thing, right? 99% of the time I'm like, my keys are not there. And then she looks and they're right there, right? So I needed to share that story with you. But the second thing is that's a little bit like what's going on here. It's a situation where God knows having kings is not going to work out all that well for Israel, but he allows it to go ahead. Fallen humanity uses power to serve itself. Redeemed humanity uses power to serve others. That's what we see in this passage. When Israel asks Samuel to give them a king, I think the warning he offers is very compelling because he doesn't say, oh, God's going to get you. Well, you better watch out. He just tells them what the king will be like. He just describes the behavior of the king. And there's this long description of the king's behavior in which he uses the word take no less than six times. The king will take your sons and daughters to serve in his army and at court. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and one-tenth of your grain. He will take your cattle, your flocks, and your herds. He will take, 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 take. In other words, the king will serve himself. He will enrich himself at your expense. That's what the king is going to do. When I read this, I couldn't help but be reminded of that old Beatles song. Let me tell you how it's, it will be. There's one for you, 19 for me. That's what we're talking about. And in the end, it's positively scary. Samuel says, you shall be his slaves. Well, that's a phrase that should have made the hair of every Israelite, listen, stand up on end. Because we know from Scripture they had already been slaves. They were a people that defined themselves by having been delivered by God from slavery. They knew what it was like to have someone else take and take and take until there was nothing left. They should have not wanted to return to that situation. And yet here they are going right back into it, not on accident or out of ignorance, but in spite having been very clearly warned by Samuel. And in fact, what we see in the rest of the Old Testament is that the kings of Israel turned out to be, at best, a very mixed bag. Some of them were good, and the Old Testament singles them out for praise, people like King David or King Josiah, men who at least tried their best to be faithful to God, tried to put the common good first. But in the eyes of Scripture, many more of the kings were bad than good. King Solomon accumulated vast wealth and built this insanely lavish temple for God. He also kept a lot of the money for himself. King Ahab framed a wealthy landowner for a crime so that he could steal his fields. King Ahaz strips the gold and silver out of the temple that Solomon built so he could bribe foreign leaders with it. The list goes on and on and on. So this situation Israel finds itself in, of being governed by a king who serves himself rather than the people, is powerfully ironic given their history. It's also universally recognizable. Everywhere we go, we see that fallen humanity uses power to serve itself, to enrich itself. A small minority uses their power and influence not to seek the common good, but to amass more and more wealth and power for themselves. You all know this, I assume, because you are residents of the state of Illinois, <laughs> the land of Rostenkowski, Ryan, and Blagojevich. Sounds like a law firm, right? The worst possible law firm ever. 
I remember my, my dad growing up in Oak Park, he went to some political event and he met a famous politician from Illinois and I said, oh dad, that had to be cool. What, would his, what was it like? And my dad, a little wiser than I was said, eh, he seemed like an operator. <laughs> and later that person went to prison, so. <laughs> but you don't have to wind up in prison to use power selfishly. One of the things we see around the world is people using power in this way. Look at the so-called crony capitalism that you have today in Russia and China, where big business and big government work hand in glove to make themselves rich and leave ordinary people out in the cold. Look at something as seemingly boring as our tax laws. According to reporting by the nonprofit group ProPublica, From 2014 to 2018, the 25 richest Americans paid a true federal tax rate of 3.4%. By contrast, most American households paid about 14% in federal taxes. 55% of the largest corporations in America paid no federal corporate income tax at all in 2020. Now that's all legal, but whatever the legal reasoning behind it, those tax people, those tax policies benefit a few people at the expense of everyone else. In scripture, we see clearly the ugly reality of how fallen humanity uses power. That's what's going on in 1 Samuel 8. Fallen humanity uses power to serve themselves. But that's not all scripture shows us. Scripture shows us another way, a better way, a different way, a redeemed way. Because redeemed humanity uses power to serve others. And that's why I chose that reading from Mark 10 that Rebecca read for us a few minutes ago. Jesus really drives this point home. The message of Mark and all the Gospels is that Jesus is the true King of Israel, He is the Messiah the one from David's line, the one who fulfills all of Israel's hopes. He is, but he is also a very different kind of king than all the ones that came before him. In his kingdom, greatness is found not by accumulating power and prestige for oneself, but by giving it away. Whoever wants to be first in Jesus' kingdom must be last, and whoever wants to be great must be a servant. Jesus knelt and washed his disciples' feet. He rode a donkey into Jerusalem and not a stallion. He reversed all of our expectations of what wielding power looks like. That's Jesus' way. That's how he redeems power. And it's important for us to acknowledge, specifically as Christians, that our goal is not to do away with power, to abolish it, to ignore it, but to redeem it to make proper use of it. The solution to many of our problems is not less power, but power used redemptively and wisely to serve others. I think of a man named Rich Stearns. He grew up poor, he worked hard, he went away to college, and then he went to business school and he was very successful in the corporate world. He got ahead. In 1995, he was named president of the Lennox Corporation, a company with a $500 million budget and 4,000 employees. He had it made, except for a little voice nagging in his mind. The voice was God, and God was calling him, it turned out, to walk away from his business career and to serve as CEO of World Vision one of the biggest Christian development organizations in the whole world. Rich Stearns took about a 75% pay cut to accept that position. As president of World Vision, he used all the same skills that helped him get ahead in the corporate world. Strategic planning, financial analysis, leading teams, and he still had a lot of power. He was still at the top of the org chart but he used that power to serve others, to serve his team, and especially to serve the poor and the marginalized in the developing world. 
Under his leadership, World Vision became leaders in addressing the AIDS crisis in sub-Saharan Africa, and later in responding to the global refugee crisis. Rich Stearns didn't just give up his power when he left corporate America, he redirected it towards serving others. I think, too, of the civil rights movement here in America. Jim Crow racism as it was practiced in the last century was essentially an effort to deny African Americans the power due to them as citizens, to take away the power of the ballot, especially. And the civil rights movement was a self-conscious effort to combat that, not just by praying about it, not simply by asking nicely, but by amassing and using power redemptively to confront sin. All the meetings, all the sit-ins, all the marches, all the bus boycotts, all the arrests, they were designed to use power redemptively, to bring to light what was happening all over America, to confront America with it, and to force it, maybe, to change its ways. They used power redemptively, and it worked. And we should all be thankful to them. We don't need less power. We need more power used wisely and redemptively. Fallen humanity uses power to serve itself. Redeemed humanity uses power to serve others. That's what we see in the Old Testament, in the stories of the kings and their many flaws and foibles, and that's what we see in the New Testament, in the story of Jesus, the king who did not come to be served, but to serve. That's what we're called to practice. That's what we're called to put into practice in every area of our life. So I want you to think about this for a second. Where are the areas in your life where you've been vested with power? Some of you are managers and supervisors at your workplace. You have a team working for you. You've been vested with a lot of power over those people, and I know many of you take that very seriously. I want you to think about how you can use that power not just to improve your bottom line, but to serve those who work alongside you. What would it be like if you did that? Some of you are spouses and parents. And even though it may not always feel like it, you have been vested with a lot of power. I want you to think about how you can use that power, not just to get your own way, but to love and serve those who God has given you in your family. What would that look like? All of you are citizens of Naperville, of Illinois, of America. And it may not feel like it, but we've been vested with a lot of power as citizens. What if we approached politics not as an exercise in getting what we want or implementing the policies that benefit us and our group? What if instead we tried to redeem political power by using it to serve and bless others? especially those in need. What would that look like? Dear friends, hear the wisdom of Scripture. Let's use power not like the kings of old, but like Jesus the King, to bless and serve others. Amen. In this season of Lent, we are sharing each Sunday in this meal that Jesus gave. As we come to the table, we remember Christ's sacrificial death on the cross. We receive Christ's life-giving presence in this cup and in this bread. And we rejoice as we anticipate Christ's coming once again in glory when he will invite all people to sit at a table with him. This is a meal of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. And so that is what we proclaim as we share together in our communion litany. I invite you to join me. Words are on the bulletin 
and on the screens. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Supper, which we are about to celebrate, is a feast of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. We remember that our Lord Jesus Christ was sent of the Father into the world to assume our flesh and blood and to fulfill for us all obedience to the divine law, even to the bitter and shameful death of the cross. By his death, resurrection, and ascension, he established a new and eternal covenant of grace and reconciliation that we might be accepted of God and never be forsaken by him. We come to have communion with this same Christ, who has promised to be with us always, even to the end of the world. In the breaking of the bread, he makes himself known to us as the true heavenly bread that strengthens us unto life eternal. In the cup of blessing, he comes to us as the vine in whom we must abide if we are to bear fruit. We come in hope, believing that this bread and this cup are a pledge and foretaste of the feast of love of which we shall partake when his kingdom has fully come, when with unveiled face we shall behold him, made like him unto his glory. Since by his death, resurrection, and ascension, Christ has obtained for us the life-giving spirit He unites us all in one body. So are we to receive this supper in true love, mindful of the communion of saints. Let us pray. Holy God, we ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would make this bread and this cup be for us the life-giving body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We remember and we celebrate that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he had a meal with his disciples, and after the meal was finished, he took the bread from the table. And giving thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat, remembering me. In the same way, he took the cup, and he said, The cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink of it, each one of you, remembering me. And every time we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we do so proclaiming the saving death of our risen Lord Jesus Christ until the day he comes again, and come again he will. This is Jesus' table. All who seek Jesus are welcome to come and receive the gifts that he gives. We'll invite you to come row by row down the center aisles. Take a piece of bread and cup. If you need gluten-free, it's available here in the middle. Anyone who's unable to walk forward, there'll be servers that are happy to bring the elements to you. I'll invite our servers to come forward.
Let's pray together. Oh God, our King and our Maker, though you are God with all the influence and status that your name implies, we praise you that you are a God who refused to pull rank and parade your power among us. Instead, you chose to step down into our experience, living among us as one of us with all the struggles and suffering that goes with being human. You are the God who serves, and we can respond to you with only thanks and praise. And we ask that you would fulfill your purpose in us, that we would be your people. May we use whatever measure of power we have to seek out and serve the least and the last and the lost. Feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, welcoming the stranger, clothing the naked, caring for the sick, befriending the lonely, visiting the imprisoned. Keep us united and strong in faith that we may always know your presence in our lives. This we ask in the name of Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and close our worship singing together. Go. 
beloved in Jesus Christ. As you go from this place, may the Lord God bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Thank you.